Hello and welcome to another edition of Inside the Burrow, the FAU podcast for and by fans. My name is Dan. I am joined by Shane and Jack as usual. And today, tonight, we are going to break down the UTSA game, uh, talk a little bit about Western Kentucky, um, and maybe throw in some some injury and, and late-breaking uh, scheduling news. So uh, I guess to get started, uh, FAU... Uh, defeated uh, UTSA 24 to three this past weekend. Pretty solid showing uh, overall. Dominant, dominant uh, defensive uh, performance. I think all of us were were super excited about uh, about how well our, our defense played. Uh, offense, you know, had had some ups and downs. Really started to establish the run. Malcolm Davidson with another strong game. Uh, his uh, his. Uh, best game of the year uh, and almost his best game uh, at FAU with 115 yards. Uh, James Charles continues to be a solid, uh, a solid backup. Uh, as we know that um, uh, BJ Emmons and Larry McCammon were not there. So uh, yeah, I mean, th- this definitely was uh, a-, a great game to see more complete game uh, from FAU. I know there's, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about struggles of the offense, um, but you know, I think uh, overall it was nice that this, this was a game that was, um, you know, FAU had, FAU had control over. And uh, honestly, t- to me, uh, in, in a conference game uh, to keep a team uh, from scoring a touchdown, I'd, I'd like to go back, uh, go back and see, I meant to do this beforehand, uh, to see how many times FAU has held a conference opponent without a touchdown. Um, so no matter the, the opponent in a conference game, to me, that, that, that's um, a pretty solid performance. So, um, I don't know, Shane. What's uh, what were your thoughts about this uh, this past game? I I'm love that you know. And this just if you just you know kind of going by the boards, we're at a point of FAU's program where a uh, twenty uh, twenty one point victory isn't enough. You know, over a team with a winning record. Yeah, I get you know the offense didn't play that great, but uh, and. and but they, they, I think they've gotten better every game in some weird ways. I mean, the Marshall game was a little weird, obviously, for all the COVID reasons. But I think they were definitely improved um, from week one to week two. I mean, or week one to week three. You know, they didn't have a half like they did against Charlotte. Uh, and dude, that defense, everything we were worried about over the summer, that front seven is literally I, – I could not be more wrong with my worries. You know, it's every player – that was kind of new and replacing somebody needed to be their full potential selves in order to replicate last year's defense. And I mean, they've all like blown away expectations. Jalen Joyner is someone who played a little bit as a freshman. I know they thought that, you know, last half thought the world of him uh, got hurt last year, four games into the season. And he was just basically handed, you know, the job the probably one of the top defense tackle roles. I, the guy's been a man eater. Six sacks from the – you know how hard it is to get six sacks from the interior in um, rushing the passer is insane. You know, obviously, we talked about Chase Laster, and it's just it's it's just been really great. Uh, Roman Mungin's going to get an interception. He dropped two against Marshall, had an interception that was called back um, on a – you know, on offside, so – it is due. I guess I'll make that. Uh, he's going to get one this week against Western Kentucky. He's due. Uh, but, yeah, I mean, it's it's the, the defense is just so much fun to watch. I mean, and, again, I'm going to just say this, that, that how different style it is from last year is crazy. I mean, that blitz call before half, 99% of coaches do not make that call and take that risk. Shane being a defensive guy, he's, he's loving this defense in this front seven. Um, you hit the nail on the head, brother. I mean, this front seven has exceeded expectations. Jalen Joyner is playing out of his mind. Leighton McCarthy, we thought we were just going to have to rely on him totally. I mean, we're still relying on him, and he, he's still doing a good job. Alvin Dempsey, Evan Anderson. Uh, hey, Chris him. Jones is going to be a Hall – he's going to be an All-American. Said. I mean, he is right. He's, he plays out of his mind as well. And it, we just don't know where they get it from. And, and Coach Taggart says that he just sits back and, and just watches these guys create havoc. Uh, Jordan Helm, another big game. Amon Ross. We wanted to talk about the offense, but that defense is so much fun to watch. I mean, shutting down Sincere McCormick, I feel like that's 
all we talked about. I, I didn't even notice him in the game. Oh, yeah. yeah. I, I'm just like, who? where is he? Yeah, exactly. Um, and so, I mean, this is the, what, the second straight week where an FAU defense stopped a really good rushing attack, if you will. Um, I, I think we could do better when it comes to containing the quarterback, preventing him from rolling out. But, I mean, if we're doing our all blitzes that we do so well on third downs when, uh, you know, guys like Chris Jones pin their ears back and just go after the quarterback, then I, I think we're fine. Uh, our running game was solid. Feed Malcolm Davidson. I mean, we, we all have seen the meme by now. They should just plaster that right in the front of the, the Schmidt Center, honestly. Just feed it to him. Uh, and Tronti had a decent day on the ground as well. I, that, that's going to be our identity. Um, we're not going to be able to really throw it deep. I mean, TJ, great talent. Aaron Young, great talent. Uh, great to see Willie Wright make some plays early in the game on those quick, flat screens. I love that. Really spreads the field east and west. But we're, we're, we're not going to be, you know, throwing bombs like we did with Lane Kiffin to Caleb Woods against Louisiana Tech 50 yards downfield. It's just, that's just not our identity anymore. Yeah, and FAU fans, like, it, people want to draw it up sometimes to coaching stuff a little bit. I mean, people forget that the 2018 year existed yeah. with Lane Kiffin, right? Like, does everyone – I, 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 I said this on the forum. Does everyone forget not scoring a point in the second half versus Middle Tennessee? Yeah. When you have – limitations sometimes at quarterback it is difficult chris robinson last year was a developed all four-star elite 11 quarterback trotty and we, we you know when we have the guests coming on we've talked about this how fau every year even underlaying even the championship years it took them a little bit before they kind of hit the full stride where it was like okay we're grinding it out we maybe took a loss played some power five opponents, offense didn't look great at times. And by the time we hit that second half of the schedule versus Conference USA, it was like, oh, game's done at halftime, right? Yeah. So, uh, yeah, and, and I hope they can, you know, just get things together. Let's also remember, and this was a little tough, like, I didn't totally agree with it with the score. Maybe that was just pure confidence in the offense. Putting Willie Taggart Jr. in, I get why they did that. In an age of COVID, JV on Posey was in street clothes. You want to get like, have your backup to have some reps out there, right? Yeah. Throw a couple passes, hand it off. You know, again, it wasn't crazy about doing it only up 14, but he Taggart's in his press conference. They want to do it in the second quarter. They probably just had a couple really basic scripted drives for him. Yep. Uh, you know, I think that kind of slowed maybe some of the momentum of the offense. Davidson yeah, sure. did get hurt for a period in that game. He missed a couple drives as well. Mm -hmm. I mean, the running back injuries are piling up. Larry McCammon, done for the year. I mean, just feel oh. for that kid. We'll probably get – most likely, I think we're going to get – B.J. Edmonds was close to playing last week. I think he'll definitely play this week. Um, so, you know, hopefully we can just keep one of these guys because you start to see Davidson is kind of a rhythm back, right? He starts to get in the rhythm and starts running. So, and, you know – and I, I saw a little mention on the forum about this earlier, the tight end position. Yeah, guys. I mean, obviously <laughs> Harrison Bryden's catching touchdowns in the NFL for a reason. Uh, you know, th there's also an element of some guys that, and I, I, I'm like, you know, use it. I was talking to a parent at the game at halftime and one of the players and, you know, one of the parents was saying that's s s for a couple, you know, some of the players, it, COVID and everything and having a quarantine affected some more than others with like condition and stuff. Some, you know, felt no something. Some just felt like some people said, Hey, I felt like I had a tough cold for a week and there was still some getting back to it. I'm not saying situation, but I'm just saying there could some players on the field that are just still working their way back from, you know, having to sit in a dorm for two weeks. Uh, so, you know, we'll, we'll see. I, I, Michael Irvin Jr. played, I think 25 snaps in the game. So hopefully we'll see more of him and that'd be nice. You know, yeah. And uh, you know, they're using Alex six Savage at tight end and some run packaging formation through give him 82. So we can get out there and be uh tackle eligible quote unquote um, in college football and get out there and block it in some run situations. Yeah. Uh, yeah. A shameless plug for uh, Ryan in the uh, midweek mashup. He, he mentioned that transition. But I, I agree. We're, that's really, really going to be in, I feel like, goal line situations. Um, wonder if there's going to be any plays set up for that where we can hit him on the flat. 
Yeah, I, I think, um, yeah, again, it's we don't know uh, who has been out. And like anybody who has been affected by, like everybody, you know, in the world is, is kind of affected by uh, the situation differently, physically and mentally. Um, you know, yes, they, they again, they, they are still going to school. And, you know, anybody who has uh, been on a Zoom meeting <laughs> more in their life and now, you know, how frustrating it can be. Uh, how just tired of it you can be and you know again now they have to do this keep it up in school and then you know continue to um you know give it all uh, in practice and stay focused there so yeah um again it, it was it was nice to see that it was uh it was you know not a, not overall not a dominant performance but nice to see a start to get some rhythm you know uh coach taggart said all is well as we know of right now um you know, and we can, you know, as Shane mentioned, that we, we hit this time in the season where a couple games in, probably starting to get the same players doing the same reps for several practices in a row. And then we start to get several weeks in a row and we can start to hit our stride uh, moving forward. And, uh, you know, maybe Marshall messes up like Marshall does uh, than they have the past couple of years and we get lucky down the road. So, um, yeah. and we always find our stride against Western as well. 2017, 2019, we've, we've, had that conversation we talked into the ground the three of us how those games and those championship years turn the tide for FAU to win uh, and go on to win conference championship yeah we went from like being a solid football team to like blowing everyone out down the yeah. stretch and you know we talked a little bit about that with our guest yeah FAU as it stands with Southern Miss added today FAU officially added rescheduled the Southern Miss game for a Thursday night uh CBS uh sports action December 10th, FBU has five games left I uh, right now, not including a possible bowl game. FAU will probably be favored in all of those. Maybe not Georgia Southern. Georgia Southern's a pretty good football team. And, you know, like I said, if, God, when every, after everything that's happened this year, when the dust settles, if, you know, we squeak out, we're seven and two, or even possibly eight and one, I mean, that's phenomenal. I mean, yeah. <laughs> I'll take that as my down season. Yeah, in a year like this, for sure. Absolutely. Yeah. I'll take eight and one with the offense looking a little sloppy because our defense is, but you know, by far the best in the conference. Yeah. All right. Well, we will um, we will move on to uh, our Western Kentucky guests. So please enjoy that conversation. Alrighty, so tonight, uh, as we've been uh, trying to do the past couple weeks, we do have a guest joining us from uh, Western Kentucky, Ross from the Tower Rack. Welcome to the show. Thanks for joining us tonight. Thanks for having me, guys. All right, uh, I guess uh, to, to kick it off, can you tell us uh, a little bit about this year's Western Kentucky team Um you know what how they've uh, how they've handled covid and and just uh you know kind of an overall summary for uh, owl fans who have not kept up with uh, how western kentucky is doing this year well, the good news is on the covid front they haven't really had any issues the bad news is the rest of the season has been pretty much a giant disappointment after last year so they went from you know 9 and 4 i mean you know a play here against FAU or Marshall, they probably win the East last year. And now, you know, they returned, I think, 17 or 18 starters. And they're sitting at two and four right now. So it's been kind of a massive disappointment against, you know, arguably a really, really tough schedule. But the fact that even against the, you know, the Marshalls and the Liberties and BYUs of the world that they play, they just really haven't been competitive against any of the good teams they've played. So... Well, what would you – Jack, go ahead. Yeah, so, I mean, Ross, I mean, we all remember the, the hype that the toppers had going into this year. They were definitely a dark horse with, with Vegas to, to win the conference. And, I mean, as you, as you said it yourself, they, they kind of fallen flat in their face. Where, where do you point the blame right now? Is it the defense that might have been a little bit overhyped? Is it the uh, issues at quarterback, maybe – Gage Walker being a bit of a disappointment, you could say, this year? I would say it's kind of all of the above. Uh, there's really hasn't been an area of the team where there hasn't been regression or massive regression. 
So last year, I mean, it's, it's number one is the quarterback. You know, Tyrell Pigram, you look on paper, he's got what, you know, seven or eight touchdowns and no interceptions, but he can't push the ball downfield. You know, you know, their rushing attack until the last couple of weeks has been just non-existent. And he got benched earlier in the season. So, you know, you bring in a, you know, last year, you know, you're kind of rolling the dice with grad transfers. Last year it worked out with Ty Story. This year just kind of hasn't worked out with Pigram. You know, I think a lot of that you could say is maybe attributable to the COVID stuff where, you know, they didn't have spring practice. They didn't have the full off season to prepare and kind of figure out what they had. But that's really the only excuse that I can think because just across the board, just regression, the receiving core is pretty much brand new. I know we talked a little bit before we started recording. You know, they they lost Lucky Jackson, who was their all-conference all receiver last year. But then uh, Jack Cord Pearson, who's from Ural's neck in the woods, uh, he left after the second game of the season. He was an 800-yard receiver. They had another senior who opted out right before the season to transfer. And then they basically have started over. And then there's just been just regression. I mean, uh, the defense that you talked about, you know, was a really good Conference USA-level defense. And – you know, a lot of it you could probably blame on the offense with turnovers and three outs and stuff like that, but they're still giving up massive yards, not getting turnovers, not getting third down stops, and just, just nothing has really clicked or gone right this year. Even like their two wins of the season, they squeaked them out, and, you know, it's arguable that they probably should have lost that Chattanooga game where they got a really kind of home-cooking call to win the game. And it's been, you know, it's, you know, after the Sanford experience, experiment I think you know Helton's got some equity after the nine and four season last year but people just have no idea and there's not been really any ex explanation why the drop-off's been so massive this year. Ross I didn't want to mention Chattanooga game but you just opened up a can of worms with that one that was <laughs> yikes for fans that don't know I mean what was it Chattanooga had a game winning go-ahead touchdown on a kick return with a minute left and it was called back because the referees after the play finished said that there was a fair catch call yeah and it's it was something like that where yeah. basically yeah so wow. western was down all game to chattanooga they finally call back they get a last second touchdown to you know go up i think it was yeah 13 to 10 and you're like okay finally this is over you know you avoid the embarrassment of losing your third straight game to an fcs team and then they run it back the only th you know by the video by the rules of the of the letter of the law the the guy is showing like he was like kind of waving off, you know, the the deep man to let him know or something like that. And I think with these electric whistles, they said that, you know, there was like confusion with the referee, you know, blowing the play dead as it happened. But, you know, it's it was a really weak call and a bad look. And, you know, you know, you don't want to win by a technicality like that. So it left it, you know, bad taste in most of the fan base's mouth. I mean, some are defending it and say, well, the letter of the law, but, you know, the fact that, you know, an FCS team like that playing their only game of the season was even, you know, competitive in that game has just shown how big of a step back this Hilltopper team's taken this year. You know, uh, I, how about, you know, some of the play of the young quarterback, uh, Kavaris Thomas, the Lakeland, uh, you know, is their kind of thought just to go to uh, him uh, for the rest of the year just to get him some work? I think that was a when they benched uh, Pigrom after I guess the third fumble against I'm trying to remember who was that against against Marshall, you know they gave Thomas he showed a little spark you know in garbage time and then against UAB he kind of looked like a you know a true sophomore who's never really seen extended action so I think they were trying to give him a leash but he was having the growing pains and the struggles with you know reads. Then he got a, uh, I think it was a hip flexor or something like hip pointer or something like that, and I got Pigram back in the starting lineup. So I don't think Thomas is really going to be a factor unless Pigram gets hurt or plays bad. So I think they announced that uh, Pigram's going to play on Saturday. I, you know, I think, you know, the the way the team is spinning it, it's going to be like okay. They've played a really tough schedule. This is the last four all-conference games. And, you know, after this week, you've got FIU and Southern Miss back-to-back. -back. You know, those are very eminently winnable games, even despite this team's struggles. So, I think they're going to pull out all their stops against FAU, saying, okay, we can – if we win this game or steal this game on the road, then the last three are very winnable. You can finish with a winning record. So, I, I think they're going to ride Pigram because he's – 
why he struggles to move the ball down the field and stuff like that. He's more of the proven commodity over Thomas, unfortunately. So, what do you, um, you know, you, you mentioned they'll they'll pull pull out all the stops for FAU. Um, outside of QB play, what do you think is, you know, by pulling out of the stops, what do you, what do you think they'll they'll need to do? Um, that to, to be successful at FAU, kind of. I think. Who, who do you think they're going to lean on more? I think they're going to, as as long as they don't fall behind early, they're going to lean on the running game. So you know, you look at the BYU game, which you know the final score forty one to ten. You know, it was a pretty big blowout, but there were some actually good you know bright points. Specifically, the offensive line you know had a really good game. They ran for I think one hundred and seventy yards or something like that, and you know, in a big blowout loss. So I think. They're finally starting to establish the run game. I think Gage Walker's got, like, back-to-back 80-yard rushing games, and they're kind of getting that identity. So I think, you know, as long as they don't fall behind big, they're going to try to control the control the possession. They're going to try to just shorten the game and then hope that their defense actually comes to play this week, which against a, a offensive – you know, looking at FAU stats, it doesn't look like their offense is really lit up the world without Chris Robinson. So – I think, you know, this could be a, a low-scoring game. I think, you know, WKU would try try to win it like, you know, 17 to 14 or, you know, 24 to 20 or something like that. It's gonna, they're going to just try to make it a low-scoring game and, you know, hope that, you know, they can make enough plays and control the clock enough to, to escape with a win. Ross, uh, r- real quick, Willie Taggart – I mean, he was a quarterback at WKU. Uh, he's a graduate. He's a, yep. So, I mean, for, first off, when when he was at USF, did did he play Western Kentucky at all, or was was he still at Western Kentucky when that game happened? About what? Yeah, yeah. He no? was at the, the he was the coach of USF when they played Western in the Boca Raton Bowl with you know Brandon Dowdy's last game after they won the first conference championship. So he lost uh, to – it was the 2015 season, so Braum. Uh, right. Braum's second to last season there. And, you know, Braum and that, that offense was just great. Unreal. And, yeah. yeah, just unreal, you know, video game numbers. And they, they handed them in the bowl game. And so that gets kind of the jitters off. I think, you know, with Willie, you know, there's a lot of love and appreciation for him. I think people were kind of sad to see him at a conference rival. I think it's, a you know, just as a – fan of his it's a good place to rebound your career after the Florida State disappointment but you know I don't think that was completely on him I think Jimbo didn't really leave him much but um, you know it's it'll be really interesting to see because Taggart's always kind of been a resurrection artist whether it was at Western or USF even Oregon's one year he was there he kind of did a good job of that but you know can he take a program that was firing on all cylinders and and keep it going. And that's, that's kind of what I'm really interested to see. I know I asked that kind of question in the, our Q and a Jack, and it's just, you know, something to see, uh, you know, he's really changed from when he was at Western, he was always a great recruiter, but he was kind of the Harbaugh Stanford type style, like grinded out back in the, you know, 10 years ago in the Sun Belt. Now, you know, it looks like a little bit more on tempo winning on athletes more than, than back in the day. So. And, and he was the, uh, First coach to win a game in FU Stadium history. That game in 2011, 20 to zero. If you remember, yeah, I do actually. Yeah, I think those those early teams because that was you know you guys kind of went through this. It was like the uh, he was the kind of the glimmer of hope in the from like a 0 and 11, and then he went or 0 and 12, and then he went 2 and 10, and then you know, that year they kind of broke out one seven of their last eight games. And yeah. yeah, I think that FAU game was one of the first ones on that streak. So it's been a very interesting series. That's for sure. Definitely. <laughs> so yeah, I, 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 go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, you know, the, you know, kind of revisiting the series, I, you know, I'll still always say uh, to heart that the 2017 game is kind of the best, of definitely the series where, you know, it's kind of a back and forth game and it just broke FAU's way in a super quick way with the Willie Wright touchdown and the Devin Motor Tangle Terry Long touchdown run. I think that one, you know, we always talk about propelled that team. And even, you know, what's funny last year, 
uh, you know, I thought, I thought, yeah, I thought both of those games, 27, 29, 2017 and 19, were almost carbon copies of each other. Yeah, in FAU, was you know, they – both seasons, they had a little bit of early season struggles. The offense was still kind of finding itself. Uh, and, you know, it, we weren't sure where we were in the conference. You know, it's like, oh, you know, we, we lost to Marshall a couple weeks before. And it's like, oh, are we about equal with each other? And it seemed after each of those Western Kentucky's games, every game after that was FAU wins by 20 points in conference. So it just seemed like the Western Kentucky games, especially those two years, just it took FAU to another level, per se. It started the run of the season. Oh, yeah. I think, you know, I think the winner of this game is going to propel them. Kind of going back to the 2017, I think that was, you know, the Sanford era, which at the time, I think they had, they started off actually 5-2, and two, even though they struggled. Yeah. Uh, and they had them well, – I think they were up 14 in the fourth quarter, and then FAU stormed back and scored – you know, 24 points or something. It was something crazy like that. Yeah. And it just kind of broke the will of the program. They we didn't. They won one game the rest of the season. And then last year's game, it was just one of those deals. It's like, man, it, it really was kind of like the conference championship eliminator game. I think, you know, that propelled you guys. You know, had, had that big moment of, you know, you know, we could have, been talking about you know are you guys going to knock off the defending champ right now so it's it's kind of yeah. interesting it was it was really you guys really had those key momentum swings in both of those games yeah um th- yeah this series really has been um uh has been even though FAU has been on the uh winning side more often than not the games have been a heck of a lot closer than than what you would think looking at the uh the yeah i'm trying record. to think what was in 2014 brahms first year like didn't the fau like steal one down there in uh florida as well i'm trying to remember it correctly yeah the what, 2014 maybe, or 2015 the trey hendrickson sack yeah, yeah. It, was, it was 14 i believe yeah oh yeah yeah oh, the lucky was, whitehead uh lucky whitehead uh screen yeah, Quez, Quez, the Quez Johnson game. Everything uh, we thought Quez Johnson should be. I believe I, we came back. We were down, I believe, twenty-one in that game at halftime. Couldn't stop yeah. Western Kentucky and FAU just bowled their way back. That is an all-time classic. Yeah, it was. It's one of those that you know it, that probably WKU fans try to forget. But I remember <laughs> it just you know that was that was like Brom, you know, wandering through, you know rookie coaching struggles is like I think it happened to two or three times where they had good leads and blew it that season and you know they ended up finishing seven and five but like they came back and I remember those last couple Brom years they they definitely gave uh, FAU the the comeuppance after that so yeah. I think what was it the the last year of Partridge what was that score like 66 or something we're not, we're not going to talk about that one. Uh, no, you know what, though? I, it, it's funny. The last Thank you year for that. Partridge, and we always, me and someone, uh, another season ticket holder, and a guy I message for in the nest. And, you know, I, I'll never forget. That was, to me, the absolute lowest point of FAU football. You know, we were it was homecoming off a of bye week. And, you know, there was a little bit of like, well, you know, if you factor all those things and, after you'd been recruiting well, but the team was so young. I remember sitting there looking at a bunch of sophomores named Aziz, I'm <laughs> sorry, on campus. And Jalen Young was only a junior. At, you know, there was a bunch of young, really young defenders. Rashad Smith was a fresh, freshman. and I think Singletary had a good game, even though in the blowout. Yeah, yeah it was it was 53, 53 to 3. 53, yeah. 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 And I remember just sitting there looking at the stadium going, we have South Florida recruits. We have this stadium. How are we – how is this possible? Like I couldn't yeah. wrap my mind around we're in year three of a coach. It's not like it was the first year we're just rebuilding after a mess and we couldn't figure it out. And I always say that game, uh, Charlie Partridge got fired. He finished the season, Yeah. but I will say, and uh, people, you know, have told me that is the game that just basically ended it for Charlie Partridge and maybe if Western Kentucky doesn't blow us out, we don't hire Lane, and you guys are winning conference time. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. All right. Well, we uh, appreciate you being on the show, Ross. And uh, for Owl fans uh, and anybody listening that wants to uh, uh, hear a little bit more from you and a little bit more about Western, what, what's, uh, what's the best place for them? 
So I would uh, follow us on Twitter at, at the Tower Rack WKU. Um, you know, we're blogging probably three to five times a week, you know, and then uh, probably that's probably the main one, you know, and then our link to the website's on there. It's through medium.com. So, um, right. you know, you know, appreciate the uh, time guys. And thanks for the collaboration. Good luck on uh, Saturday. I hope it's at least a close game after <laughs> how the season started for us. So, yeah. Awesome, man. We, uh, we appreciate it and um, we'll see you Saturday. All right. Thanks guys. All right, we uh, hope you enjoyed that conversation with Ross, and um, we hope you enjoyed this episode. And as always, we appreciate you joining us here on FAUWallaceNest.com. Make sure you check us out there on Twitter, uh, iTunes, Spotify, really any place. Um, we, uh, we hope to uh, get in front of you and get, uh, get in your ears. So um, FAU, again, plays Western Kentucky this uh, Saturday at uh, 6 p.m. And uh, for those that are out of town, uh, there's a couple things that uh, is on Fox Sports Sun. And if you know somebody, one a quick hack here, if you know somebody from South Florida, ask them to borrow their, uh, their Comcast login. And if you're out of the area, you might be able to, um, uh, to get into it that way. If you're, yeah. if you're out yeah, of the area. Yeah. It's also on a lot of Fox regional areas. Yes. Fox Sports South, Fox Sports Southeast. It, it was on Fox Sports like Phoenix. So it's on a lot of Fox Sports. We've been getting this question every week from people about how to watch. Yeah, so I want to share it. And the cool thing about these Fox Sports games is you can rewatch the game twice a day for a whole week. Yep. As as they I they reshow it continuously the whole week on Fox yeah. Sports. So the, the it's, it's actually been a re- stadium has a really good partnership going here. It, it agreed. Uh, the UTSA game was actually going against election coverage uh, on Tuesday night, which I thought was hilarious. <laughs> yeah, that was Probably good. Record and, number. Did we get more viewers? Did we get the viewers split on that? (laughs) It's still coming in. It's still coming in. Just so the fans know, on FAWilesNest.com, each game module will have the uh, stream link and the channel in the local media market listed in the original post of each um, uh, module. So It's on the first page if you click on it. So very first post um, in the first page. Thank you, Dan. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right. So, uh, yeah, we appreciate you guys being with us and, uh, we'll catch you guys next week. Go out.